Good to see you all here. We're in uh, 2 Corinthians. We started chapter 9 last week. I'm going to re read from the uh, International English Bible just to set the stage for us, starting at chapter 9, verse 1. I don't need to write to you about helping the holy people in the land of Judea, because I know you are ready. I've been bragging about you to the Macedonian believers. The Christians in Achaia were prepared a year ago. Your excitement has made most of them start giving. But I'm sending these brothers so that our pride in you about this matter will not be empty words. Then you'll be prepared, as I was saying all along. What if some Macedonian believers come with me? They might find that you're not prepared. Then we would be ashamed of you because we were so sure. You would be ashamed too. Therefore, I thought that I ought to ask these brothers to come to you ahead of time. They can help collect the money which you promised long ago. Then, as a generous gift, it will be ready, not something I forced you to do. Remember this. The person who plants only a few seeds will harvest very little, but the man who plants a lot of seeds will gather a great harvest. Each person should give as he planned ahead of time in his heart. He should not be sorry that he gave or feel forced to give. God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to give you everything you need. You'll always have more than enough to do any good deed well. It is like what this scripture says. God gives freely to the poor people. His righteousness lasts forever. God supplies seed to the man who plants and he will supply him with bread to eat. God will also give you plenty of spiritual seed and cause your righteousness to grow into a fine harvest. He will make you rich in every way so that you may always be generous. This will cause the people to thank God for what came through us. You are helping them. It is a serving ministry which does two things. One, it takes care of the needs of the holy people. Two, Many people will thank God like an overflowing river. I do want you, us to notice quickly something about the way they translated that, and that is this idea of ministry. Uh, for a number of years, people called me a minister of the gospel, which of course I am, but the reality is that every Christian's a minister, or ought to be. Every Christian ought to serve. Now, you may not serve in the same capacity somebody else does. You, you may be particularly good in one area and not particularly good in another. I mean, somebody looked at me Wednesday night and we were talking about who's doing what in the devotional. I said, well, you don't want me to lead the singing. I can tell you that uh, up front. You know, it's just not my, not my strength, you know, to do that. So uh, that's something to remember. All of us are ministers the beauty of this is that the, this gift freely given is going to have a result. And the result is a thanksgiving, abundant thanks being given to God. So what an idea. God graces us with what he gives us. And we in turn grace others with what he gave us. And they give grace to God, give thanks to God. So it's grace, grace, grace. Grace to God, to you, grace to you, to them, grace from them back to God. So it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, cycle, if you would, that we're talking about. Uh, Thayer looked at that word that's translated here, liberality. He says it means singleness, simplicity, sincerity, mental honesty, the virtue of one who is free from pretense and dissimulation without self-seeking. That's, that's an interesting way to put that. When you think about it, uh, we think of liberality and we think about the amount. But here, what uh, Thayer says is this word really means the heart. What's your heart like? Why, why not focus on the amount? Because some people don't have a lot to give. But if, they're, if their heart is good and they're giving all they can, then that's liberal. And I like that definition. That's, that's a beautiful definition. Because it means the widow with very little can actually give more than the 
uh, you know, grown man that's in high up in the business world, you know, maybe, because she gives out of her heart. And that's what makes it liberal. That's what I believe Jesus uh, referred to, as we've already talked about, with the widow and her two mites. So verse 13 of chapter 9. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. Uh, When Wayne Jackson looked at that, he said, through gracious liberality of their gift, they would be demonstrating the integrity of their obedience to the gospel of Christ and their confession thereof, not only to the saints in Jerusalem, but unto all. Who are the all? He says the saints everywhere. Uh, Even non-Christians who may be beneficiaries of this gift, either directly, as you see in Acts 24, 17, Galatians 6, 10, or indirectly, or hear of it as a result of widespread report. Uh, People hear, I'm going to tell you, the most curious thing I believe that's happened to me in church office in a long time. Somebody called and asked to speak to the pastor. Well, if you're talking about people in the in the uh, rest of the religious world, they're thinking preacher. Okay, uh, that's not correct. I'm not a pastor, uh, and don't want to be called that. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, as as Lyndon Johnson said, if I'm nominated, I will not run. (laughs) Uh, I I might go the same road with that. But at any rate, here's what happened. This woman says, uh, I'm a member of this independent church down in Florida. And I said, okay. And she said, uh, we've heard about all the troubles in Jackson. Uh, with the ice and the water and all that, and we want to help. Uh, where should we send a check to? And I said, well, I gave her the address. I said, just curiosity, how did you hear? She said, we researched it on the Internet. We know about you people. That church gives. That church is constantly working with people. Well, isn't that something? See, I've never met that woman. Hadn't met her till today. I've seen her check. <laughs> it did come from, from that independent church. It came. So what we need to realize is that uh, when we're doing what's right, word gets out. Some way, somehow, it gets out. And Paul said that ends up giving more praise to God. And that's what we're really all about, or at least what we ought to be about. Verse 14. Oh, sorry. Yes, okay. Yeah. Yes, it, 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 the word obedience is kind of interesting. It is interesting. We sometimes think obeying the gospel is hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and then live faithful life. You don't put number six on the end uh, down there. That, uh, that's usually the way we define it. Here, Paul comes along and he defines obedience to the gospel as going further. Uh, in in the form of our giving, which, of course, is living the faithful life. I understand that. But it's much more detailed than maybe we allow it to be. So uh, very important that we see that in terms of our commitment. All right, verse 14 of chapter 9. And by their prayer for you who long for you because the exceeding of grace of God in you... Uh, The Christians in Jerusalem, even the non-Christians, are going to give thanks to God because of the gift that's coming from Corinth. And that that happens all the time with money that you give and that I give. Uh, People are thankful for it. God gets gets the blessings. Somebody will say, thank you. And they're looking at me. I said, don't thank me. Thank the church. It's all of us. It's a family. We're all working together. Then he, how could you possibly talk about liberality and great gifts without going to verse 15? He says, that's, Paul can't. I can tell you that. You might be able to, Paul can't. Listen to verse 15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. How 
can we really put into words what Jesus did at Calvary? I have a, a dear friend, some of you know him uh, from this area. He's uh, health-wise not always able to be here, but he's always watching us online uh, if, and with us in that way uh, if he's not able to be here. And a few days ago, when I'd done those first three sermons on Isaiah 53, he said, I'm going to be so glad when you get off of this Isaiah stuff. It's eating me up. He said, I'm, I, it, it's just cutting into my heart to hear what Jesus did. Well, I'll do that to all of us. And, and it is indescribable. How do you put into words what Jesus did for us? It's a, it's a very, very important uh, idea. And by the way, uh, this word, indescribable, is only used here in the New Testament. No, no other place is it used. And I, I found that interesting that it applies only to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the gift that God gave us. All right, chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in the presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. All right, now, stop a minute and think about this whole letter. Up until now, Paul would often say we. He'd be talking about himself and Titus and the other brethren that were with him. But now you watch how he opens this chapter and he does everything in his power to say, okay, I've been talking in the past. It was me and everybody else talking to you. All the brethren are with me, but now it's just me. And at this point, we shift into a gear that, that is never seen in the writings of Paul unless you want to count 2 Timothy chapter 4. Because suddenly he totally focuses on himself. And when he does this, watch how many times he says, You've driven me to do something I don't want to do. Over and over again, he's going to say that. I don't really want to go here, but you forced me to go here by what you've allowed to happen. And so I, Paul, myself, hidden. who's he taking on? He's taking on his accusers. This is a letter directed to the whole church, but his accusers have specifically been saying, you know, Paul, he ain't much when he's in person. His letters sound really powerful. But you, he comes in person and he's, he's just a weakling. Just a weakling. And Paul just picks that up. Uh, he said, in presence, you know, I'm, I'm going to put my words, I'm not much. That's what they say. But in letter, I'm bold. Okay, that's where he's starting. That's the accusation. Now watch him pick up off of that because he picks it up real fast. Uh, verse 2, as he as he continues, but I beg you that when I am present, I may be not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. I want, to, I want you to think about this. Uh, I, I vividly remember it was a comedian that actually did it, but when he did it, I thought, well, I, I know what he's talking about there. You ever heard your mama think back now? Most of us are going to have to think back a little way. Did you ever hear your mama say, don't make me come up there? Did you ever hear that? Don't make me come down there. What is she saying? She's saying, I want to love and hug on you, but if you're going to keep doing what I think you're doing from what I hear, when I get there, you're not going to be happy I came. Here's Paul writing to his children at Corinth. And as, he, as really verse 1 and now on into verse 2, what's he saying? Don't make me, don't make me come there with boldness. Don't make me be as bold in person as I have been in the letter. But he said, but I intend to be with those false teachers. I intend to deal with them. Uh, brethren, I, I always emphasize or try to that we've got to speak in love, but speaking in love does not mean you cannot be bold. You know, if you couldn't be bold and, how, and love your children at the same time, how, how would you ever spank them? 
See, you got to be both. They got to know you love them. Uh, but at the same time, they got to know you mean business. I, the, the mark's right here. Don't go over that. You go over that, you're going to pay for it. I'm going to make sure of that. So you know what I'm talking about. That's what Paul's doing right here. Same type of, of idea going on in this place. Let's go on to verse uh, 3 as he continues. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Paul said, I'm a man. And they'd accused him of being weak. And, you know, I, I think there's a sense in which Paul would accept, okay, I'm a weak guy. Uh, look, he'd been, when you get into the list, we're going to get into his list in chapter 11. When you think all he's gone through, it's a wonder the man could still walk. I mean, it really is. Was he weak? Probably. You know, very possibly he was weak. But he said, that, that's in the flesh. He said, I'm not fighting fleshly. I'm fighting spiritually. And he's already told us that while he's weakening in, in flesh, that's into chapter 4, he said, I'm getting stronger every day in the Spirit. See, so there, there's the contrast. And now he's, he's beginning to pull all these threads together, if you think about it, from early on till, till right now. All right, verse 4, he continues. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So we don't use submachine guns and tanks. And, and, uh, and airstrikes called down from a, what, a drone or whatever they're using now. We don't do that. Uh, instead, what are we doing? Our weapons are mighty. Now watch where he says they are, in God. In God. We're talking about God's Word. And God's Word, truthfully, is more powerful than a hydrogen bomb. It's, it's powerful in a different way. No doubt about it, but powerful nonetheless. Verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul says we're going to pull down all the, all the battle works, all the walls that Satan's tried to erect. We're going to pull all those down so that we can bring everything into captivity to Christ. You almost can see... Uh, Jericho, can't you? If you think in physical terms, you see that the mighty walls of Jericho coming down, the army of Jerusalem, every man of Israel just walking straight up. Just go straight ahead. That's your territory. And you're, you're going to carry it out. That's exactly what's going on here. Paul says, we're going to take down everything that stands against uh, God. And in place of that, we're, we're going to... Uh, turn you a different direction. He'll talk about that as, as he goes forward. Our job then is to, and I like the way Jackson put it, we am, analyze and demolish the false reasonings or arguments. That's from the American Standard Version in the footnote. And it's also in the ESV. Both of them have that. Uh, we oppose every arrogant teaching that is contrary to the knowledge of God. We capture and take prisoner every evil thought, not simply to defeat someone, but to bring them to obedience to Christ. It is to Him they must surrender. You, many of you know I debated for, for years. I started in seventh grade and debated all the way through two years in college. Uh, on the intercollegiate level, uh, we had some... My partner and I had some good success, mostly because my, my partner was a wizard. I mean, if you think I can speak, and guess what his major was? Biology. But he, could, he won speaker points almost every time. Four speakers, he wins speaker points. I'd be number two, but he's always number one. <laughs> always. Uh, but here's the problem that my dad saw, and he kept warning me, he kept saying, if you're going to preach, debate's going to ruin you. Now, he was, he's not talking about the ability to reason. That's, that's not the point. What he's talking about is in debate. Or you can ask Teresa. I was always glad Teresa was on the debate team, but not my partner. Because I, my partner knew that I was going to rip it apart. We were going to go after him with, you know, with everything we had. And, and we were in there. We were in it to win it. <laughs> we didn't play to lose, you know, that, that whole thing. Well, Dad, Dad's point was this. When it comes to saving souls, 
You're not in it to win an argument. You're in it to win a soul. And there's a difference. It took me several years and a lot of patience from that little blonde from Nashville to finally get to where hopefully I portray a love for souls. That's the more important thing. Uh, I still don't like to lose. <laughs> That's true. But it's a different thing. I don't like to lose souls. I don't like to see anybody lost is the point. And I want us to see this in Paul. He's going to defeat the arguments, but he's not trying to lose people. He's trying to save people. He's not trying to win battles and lose people, is no, in other words. He's trying to, to win both. And being ready to pu punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. He, Paul was confident. Now, don't you love the way he writes? He will almost, without fail, say, I know you're going to do what's right. I know you're going to do what's right. That's what he's doing right here. Uh, and when you get through obeying, we're going to take care of all the disobedient. We're going to punish them when, when we come. And that's, so they don't have to worry about him coming, but boy, those, those false teachers do because he's going to deal with them and he's not going to be timid about it, although they accuse him of that. All right, verse 7. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. All right, that's, that's verse 7. And as Paul is going through this, he, he wants them to know that uh, we all basically in Christ hold the same position. Uh, with God. Uh, you know, God doesn't love one child more than another. See, men will make that mistake. You go back to, think about uh, Isaac and Rebekah, what a tragedy that was in that family. Because Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob and it made a mess. Well, when it comes to God, it won't be... Uh, you know, God loves you know, Bobby over there and doesn't like Gary, doesn't love Gary. We're equal. He loves Bobby, but he loves Gary. Is the point. Thank you, Bobby. I'll try not to abuse you over there. But it's true. It's true. He loves every one of us. You cannot pick a person in the in the body of Christ that God doesn't love. And Paul's saying, You're Christ, well, so am I. So, you know, quit, quit pretending that I'm something other than in Christ is, is basically uh, what's going on. The false teachers must have been using this accusation or he wouldn't have brought that up. Verse 8, For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. All right, now notice, Jesus, he says, gave me some authority. But was the purpose of the authority to destroy them? No. He said, not destroy, build up. That's why God gave me authority, was to build people up. Now, if you think about it, isn't that a pretty good explanation for why when he came, he was so kind and loving? And they could portray him, the false teachers could say, oh, he's timid, he ain't nothing when he's in person. Well... He's trying to, to build them up. He's trying to show them the right way. That's the point. And he's, he's answering that. Uh, he's, and he's, he's not ashamed to do what he did. Lest I seem to terrify you by letters. And see, now he's still dealing with those false teachers. What do they accuse him of? Well, when you're in person, you're not much. But boy, in your letters, you sound like you could, you could just tear them up, you know. And uh, <clears throat> I get the biggest kick out of watching some of these, some of these ball clubs playing another ball club, and and some some one of their players will pop off and say, you know, there ain't nothing. We're gonna tear them up. And you know what the other team does? They cut that out of the paper and they pin it on the bull, bulletin board because uh, they say we're gonna go show them in person. You know, well Paul is you know. He has not just been terrifying in letter. He, he can be that way in person. He'd rather not. 
but he can be if he, if he needs to be. So he goes on. This is what they accuse him of. This is uh, verse 10. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. And remember, if you go all the way back to the first letter, chapter 2, what do they accuse him of? Uh, you're not really much to listen to, and you're sure not much to look at. <laughs> and Paul comes back, and he says, here's what you're accusing me of. And you know, he, he's really not going to deny that he's, he's not going to say, well, I am a great order. Now, could I make a, a quiet observation? Read Acts chapter 14. Because when Paul and Barnabas arrive in the area around Lystra and Iconium, ultimately Derby, when they get there and they heal the man, you may remember that the, these, the priests of the false god come out and they're going to offer a bull to these two gods as they see them. Because, of course, they worked a great miracle with the power of God. No doubt about that. Do you notice who they called which one? Barnabas is the is chief of the gods. He's Zeus, you know, if you're thinking about it in terms of uh, Greek uh, terms. But Paul, he's the spokesman of the gods. So I have always wondered, is he really not a good speaker? Or is this just an accusation of the false apostles at Corinth? I really lean toward it's just an accusation, not really accurate. But Paul will accept it. He don't mind. Call him whatever you want to, as long as you listen to the truth. See, that's, that's where he's going to go uh, as he thinks uh, about these various things. So go ahead to verse 12. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. <clears throat> you want to know the one place I guarantee you that a football team will always have a victory? Scrimmage. Yeah. One, one side or the other is going to win <laughs> in scrimmage. And, you know, I, I don't know about the colors. I'm just going to choose two, two colors, you know, the blue team and the red team. In practice, well, the red team may just whip up on the blue team and they may strut around and say, look at us, look what we... Well, let's wait till you get to play some, uh, somebody else. <laughs> you may look good against yourselves, but how do you look against the other team? You know, occasionally <clears throat> uh, we overstate our case. And that's what these, these folks... Doing Paul said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get into this comparison bit, you know, where I'm comparing me with you and you with me. That said, you know, because I may be, you know, you ever heard the expression? I'm sure you have. He's a big fish in a small pond. <laughs> if you pull a big fish out of a small, small pond and put him in the big lake, he may be he may be the wimp, you know, the whole thing. So Paul's warning us the area who are we supposed to compare ourselves with. Christ. That's what, and we're not going to measure up ever to Christ. And we're going to try. We're going to keep working toward that. But that, that's where he's going uh, with his thinking here. So we, however, verse 13, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. Okay, what is Paul's sphere of preaching. Well, when Jesus talked to Ananias, he said, I'm going to send him to the Gentiles. I'm going to send him to kings and to people in authority. That's going to be his job. Okay, now if he's going to the Gentiles, is Corinth part of that? Absolutely. Now that sphere is repeated again in Acts 22. Paul tells about it. Acts 26, Paul tells about it. He also mentions it in Romans chapter 15, verse 20. So all those times he mentions it, he's got, he's got a specific assignment from God. He, yes, does he, he preach to Jews? Yes, but mostly preach to Gentiles and people in authority. And have you ever thought that the Jews actually opened the door for Paul to do more preaching? 
We, I, I talked about this a few weeks ago, we need to reframe things. Put it in a different picture frame. It'll look different. I've watched, you know, Teresa, in my mind, is a pretty fair painter, artist. Uh, but sometimes you can take a painting out of one frame, put it in another one, and it just totally changes the view of the painting. It highlights something else that, that you didn't see before. Uh, there was, you know, Hiram and some of the others, that, uh, and Charles, isn't that what we did at work day? Not too long ago, we jerked up old shrubs that, you know, didn't look good anymore. They maybe did one day, they just didn't anymore. We took out lights that were busted and laying down, made this place look like we didn't care, and, and we, we made the place look better. You know, people trimmed bushes and, you know, all kind of stuff, right? Made it look better, okay. Well, that's, that's uh, what we, we've got to realize uh, that, that we're trying to do here, that Paul's trying to do, that his role is to go in and clean up and make things look, look better so, uh, through the gospel. So he goes ahead. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ. And if you remember the first letter, he said, I'm your father in the gospel. He was the first one to bring the gospel to Corinth. And so anybody that was converted in Corinth, Paul had a hand in it. Now, he would tell you, God worked through me. Okay, That's, we don't want to ignore that. But, but he had a hand in their conversion. All right, verse 15, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. As the church at Corinth grows, then Paul's work in among the Gentiles grows, right? That's exactly right. You know, uh, it tickles me to death, you know, to, to hear that one of the guys that I trained years ago to preach is now, you know, well thought of, and he, he may get bigger and better opportunities than I do. Okay. Great. You know, because the work of God's going forward. Uh, you all, this congregation has produced preachers. You've produced elders who are not here anymore. But are they doing a good work somewhere else? If they are, that reflects well on this church, doesn't it? It does if we frame it right. And that's what Paul, he loves to do that. He picks up on it uh, quite, quite often, <clears throat> as a matter of fact. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's fear of accomplishment. Now, if, if you read Paul in the book of Romans, uh, he, he specifically says, my, my ambition is to preach where the gospel's never been before. So, you know, one of the, one of the things he tells the Roman brethren is, I, I, I'm planning to come by and see you on my way to Spain. Well, nobody else has been to Spain that we know of. But Paul's on his way. Because he constantly wants to go where the gospel's never been. He doesn't want to build on somebody else's work. It's not that he's embarrassed to do it or he's unwilling to do it. He goes to Rome. Rome exists before Paul went there as a church. Uh, so he's not afraid to do it. But he, his real goal, just keep, keep planting the seed somewhere new. That's his real goal. Uh, and, and that ought to be ours as well. But he who glories, verse 17, let him glory in the Lord. You want to talk about how great you are? Talk about how great you are in the Lord. Uh, the Lord's one that empowers us. That's his point. Verse 18. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. See, I can brag about me about what a good... I don't do that, but I could. Brag about what a great Christian I am. Would it matter? No. Only if God says, I'm a good Christian. That's when it matters. I'm one of his people. I'm one of his loved ones. So that's, that's Paul's uh, way of, of thinking. So chapter 11, oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. All right, now, notice Paul doesn't like going here. You see his wording I hope you'll bear with me in some folly. He doesn't really think it's the role of any of us 
to boast about who we are and what we've done. Okay? But the false teachers have driven into this knot, but I do want you to watch how he does it. If you look at his list of bragging points, you're just shaking your head, thinking, well, I don't know if I want to be on that list or not. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't know if I want to beat him on that list. You know, he, he got plenty that he's dealt with, but it's not really the good stuff, you know, really. So he goes ahead, for I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, he's using New Testament uh, understandings of things. Uh, it was very often the case that uh, a father would, would commit his child to marriage before the child was very old at all. I remember Paul is their father in the faith, right? So he says, I have committed you to marriage, betrothed you to who? To Christ. And so what's his goal is to make sure that when they come before Christ to, for the final marriage ceremony, that's going to be in the day of resurrection, when they come, they're ready. They're pure. They're clean. They're the kind of bride he's going to be proud to have. That's his message. And it's really a, a beautiful message. But then he goes on, but I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, simplicity can be translated there, purity. In fact, some the marginal reading of the New King James uh, uses that. Uh, this re <coughs> Excuse me. Very few things worse than choking on your own spit, but I, I do that every now and then. <clears throat> okay, uh, what's this reference to the serpent? Well, it's going back to the Garden of Eden. And he's saying, you know, I don't want you to be, to be brought into the same situation that Eve and Adam were brought into because of the work of the serpent. Well, I, specifically, he appears to be zeroed in on Eve. And, and I think for good reason. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, you're going to see the Apostle Paul as he gets toward the end of that chapter in our English translations, uh, talking about how that, uh, that the woman was deceived. See, and this, uh, well, as we men all grin at that and, and nod our heads, you know, so that don't surprise me. Well, you better be careful because the man went into it, eyes wide open. And to me, that's worse. Uh, I'm sorry the woman was deceived. That's not a good thing. You know, we need to, we need to learn not to be that naive or that, you know, that easy to, uh, to lead astray. But really, the man's the one who ought to have been ashamed. You know, if you all know the whole truth, I mean, really ashamed because he knew what he was doing, according to Paul. Okay, so here he comes along. He says, I don't want you to be, to, to be swayed by the devious methods of Satan. And you know what? Satan's always worked the same way. We're going to talk about that this morning in, the, in, our, uh, by, in our worship lesson, the sermon. Uh, he's always worked the same way. He doesn't change. And he, he loves to fool you. you know? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you something I, I don't think I'll be saying in the lesson, although I'm extemporaneous, so you know. Uh, I don't have it memorized, and it's not written on a, it's not written down on a manuscript. Okay, so... Uh, but I've told preacher students many times, I said, you want to you understand how Satan works? Just study advertising. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now, I will repeat that, by the way, in the sermon. But uh, that's how they work. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll show you a picture that's intended to draw your eye. Uh, for example, uh, they'll make you think that, boy, if you've got this, you're going to be the best. You know, you're going to be right up there at the top. That's their, that's their approach. That's the devil's approach. You know, that's the way he works. He's a deceiver. Look out. But then he goes on. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Paul this is not a commendation. Paul is saying, you know, when the false teachers come, you're just so proud to listen to them. 
And then when we talk about what I've delivered to you, which is the gospel, which is the real Jesus, well, you, you know, you ignore that. This is not a commendation, brethren. This is, this is a, a, a bit of a, of a discipline uh, of sorts uh, because they've not done what they ought to do. Uh, Jackson said, you're highly critical of me and my teaching on the most superficial grounds. Yet when a false teacher comes who is corrupt regarding Christ and his gospel, you're very tolerant of him. Where is the logic in this? And boy, that's a pretty good question. You know, pretty good question. So he goes on, uh, verse 5 of chapter 11. For I consider that I'm not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Now, do a little studying. Go to, for example, the book of Galatians. He's very emphatic there. Uh, Paul did not learn his gospel from men. He learned it from Christ, just like they did. Now, did he walk with him on earth? No. Didn't walk in the arm. When did Jesus teach him? Well, I can give you my suspicion, but I can't tell you. Uh, my suspicion is that when he goes, uh, when he goes off into Arabia after his baptism, that that's when Jesus taught him. But is that when it happened? I don't know. When are we going to find out? I'm hoping that the Lord tells us a lot of these things when we get to heaven. <laughs> you know, I've got a list in my mind of things I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> when I get to heaven, you know, so uh, there, there you go. <laughs> but uh, Paul is not behind any apostle. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. All right, with that as a setting uh, for uh, the beginning of next time, we'll pick up at verse 6, Lord willing. Now, don't, don't go away because Brother Andy's got a word or two to say. Thank you. You might need that. Good morning. We still, at each session, want to uh, talk about our trying to reach out to our neighbors and our co-workers, uh, our friends and our family and so forth and so on, uh, for a lot of reasons. One is just invitation to services maybe or one could be just uh, say we've got this stuff on the internet we'd love for you to see it uh, and and tell me what you think about it maybe a bible study uh, i do want you to pray for me i'm in the process of trying subtly to uh, uh, teach someone right now it's kind of a difficult situation won't go into any depths about it but I'd like for you to pray for me uh, courage and wisdom to be able to do that. Um, so what we would like to do today is do something a little bit different. Uh, remember a contact is anybody that you've just talked to and reached out to about anything to do with the church or, or the Bible. And we're trying to keep up with that. And the reason for that is not because of numbers, but it is so that the church can pray about it uh, and, and maybe for us to look around and see some things that are going on and it possibly will uh, cause us to be, to, to be more involved in this. So it's just one more campaign. Is there anybody in here this week? You're not going to speak. I, we're, all we're doing is counting. Is there anybody in here this week that has, has had a contact? Any show of hands? Okay, so Derek, anybody else too? Anybody else has had a contact? Okay, let's try this week for... Yes, Bible study or... Okay, Shonda. Very good, Shonda. So we want to remember, you know, whatever Derek is working on, whatever Gary is working on, whatever Shonda is working on, pray for me, uh, that some of these will turn into an interest by those to, to want to obey the gospel. I mean, that's, that's our goal, Okay. So let's pray about that, and I would encourage all of you to try your very best this week to reach out to others. Father, we are so grateful for this morning, Father. We're grateful for the lesson that we heard from your word, Father. We pray that we will always be people that whatever we do and the reasons that we're doing things is for the obedience of the gospel, Father. 
Father, we pray that you would be with all of us as we continue to reach out for, to those around us, Father. Uh, people that we love and we love their souls, Father, we pray that you would give us the courage and the wisdom that's necessary to be able to to teach them the gospel, Father, to to maybe give them a kind word that may show them the true church, may show them the, the, the true Messiah, Father, and Savior. Father, again, be with us all. Help us to always love you more. Help us to take our minds away from this world, Father, and put our minds more on uh, heavenly things, Father, as I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.